and I said something about, well, here's this, it wasn't McConkie, it was EMB, but here's what Salmonella looks like on EMB, and here's what E. coli looks like. And it's not that E. coli, it's not a red bacterium, right? You know it's not a red bacterium. It looks dark like that because it's fermenting the lactose. So it's just, Salmonella especially is kind of famous for that. Shigella is kind of somewhat rare in this part of the world, um, but it, it also is a non-lactose fermenter. So you're right, there's more than one species of Shigella though, but we're not getting to that level of detail. And, and Salmonella, there's actually like 200 different strains of it, you know, but most of them are, in, are lactose negative so in general pathogens in stool that are lactose non-fermenters and whereas the normal flora most all of them are that so this is a generality yeah shigella shigella is named after a guy shigella shigi there was a picture on the angels for a while It was named after a Japanese researcher who discovered this toxin. So are we okay on those guys? So let's talk a little bit about this lab, which you really didn't have time to do. We were pushing it. So everyone progresses at different rates, I realize that, or different speeds. So the bottom line is I have to sort of pitch it in the middle and I realize for some people it's way too slow and for other people it's way too fast. So if I'm going too fast for you, you're just gonna have to do a little extra work at home and get caught up, okay? So, I mean, it's just the reality of teaching at a community college, so. Um, and I embrace diversity, <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about the pigmentation lab which most of you, all you did was take a picture and you didn't even draw anything in your notebook. Well, you want to transfer that as soon as possible to your notebook so you kind of vaguely remember what that was all about, okay? So this is why I'm trying to say, okay, let's try to get caught up. It's a good day to get kind of caught up. Um, we have a lot to do in lab today, don't get me wrong, but we have time to kind of get caught up so we don't get so far behind you don't remember what you did, okay? So remember that, for this lab, there were three racks in the back of the room that you should have taken pictures of. One of them demonstrated what I called intracellular pigmentation, which meant the cell itself has the colored molecule inside it. So most bacteria, hopefully you've noticed this already, are kind of colorless, or maybe they're sort of beige or something. No, they're just not real distinctive in their colors. Um, and, but there are some notable exceptions. So we gave you some examples. And if you look at the names of those, you might notice that sometimes the name tells you a little bit about the color. So for example, one of the bacteria is called chromobacterium. The name chromobacterium means colored bacterium. That's literally what it means. That's the genus name. The species name is Violaceum, violet. And hopefully your picture, and this sometimes it doesn't translate that well, it's sort of a purple color, okay? And it has a purple pigment that it keeps inside of the cell, okay? Micrococcus luteus, luteus means sort of yellow. And it's kind of yellow, 
whereas Micrococcus roseus, and again, as it goes through the projector, it's usually not as strong as your, hopefully your pictures are better. Micrococcus roseus is sort of rosy, orangey, pink. That's what the name means, okay? Uh, let's see, Serratia marcescens, hopefully you remember, is red. Staphylococcus aureus should be yellow. Staphylococcus aureus should be yellow. Uh, Rhodosporillum rubrum, rubrum means like red. It should be sort of a reddish color. And then finally, the last one, Streptomyces albus. Albus, like albino. It's like white, super white in color. So you may or may not have gotten that with your uh, phones, but that's kind of what you're looking for. And again, it's not about beautiful artwork. You can take your colored pencil and do these really quick, you know, purple, yellow, orange, red, just really quick. It's, it's not about the artwork, it's about remembering the name with the color. And remember that these intracellular pigments are there for a reason. They're there for a similar reason that humans have melanin in their skin. So what's the purpose of melanin in human skin? Protection, protection from UV light. Okay, so it offers some protection. So it's thought that, if you read the lab, that these intracellular pigments in bacteria protect from UV light and, if you read the lab, and those pigments also are used to sort of soak up oxygen-free radicals. Oxygen-free radicals are toxic forms of oxygen, which you might vaguely remember from the lecture. So I'm paraphrasing what's in the lab manual, trying to emphasize what you need to know. I like to answer discussion questions. So the purpose of intracellular pigments is to protect from UV light and to help make toxic forms of oxygen less toxic, to soak those up, those oxygen-free radicals. Okay, next, there was another rack that had extracellular pigmentation. So extra means it's excreted outside of the cell. And if you looked at those four slants, you might have noticed the color was not so much on the surface of the slant where the bacteria were growing, but it actually diffused into the media, which is why these tubes have been turned a little bit so you can see that the media itself was colored. So there were two bacteria in the extracellular pigmentation. One of them was Pseudomonas aeruginosa, A-E-R, that one, aeruginosa. That's actually a pretty significant pathogen in humans. Pseudomonas aeruginosa causes things like burn, or if patients that get burned, like badly burned, they get pseudomonas infections in them. It can cause something less serious, like an outer ear infection, like swimmer's ear. It can, excuse me, cause pneumonia in cystic fibrosis patients. So all of this we'll talk about later in the semester, but I'm just sort of introducing it a little bit. So Pseudomonas aeruginosa, really important, but it produces a pigment not only on a slant, it produces an extracellular pigment in tissues, in vivo. And sometimes you can see it. It'll actually turn pus or infected tissues green, like a blue-green color. So the, the pigment it produces is called pyocyanin. Pyocyanin is sort of a blue-green color. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but if a, if a patient has suffered a really serious burn over a large portion of their skin, there's two things that they worry about right away, uh, other things later, but initially they worry about dehydration and secondly, they worry about infection. Because when you learn, lose some of your skin, then your fluids can literally evaporate. Your skin holds tissue, your 
water into your tissue. So usually if someone's had a really serious burn, they gotta get an IV going right away and open up and get that saline in there. Cause, so you don't want them to dehydrate. You also don't want them to get infections. And Pseudomonas is one of the first uh, organisms that causes infections in burn patients. So bottom line is that excreted pigment can also be seen in patients. Google it, you'll see, okay, it's disgusting. By the way, this is not gangrene, that's something else. This is not gangrene, okay. Uh, gangrene is not green as in G-R-E-E-N, okay, this is not gangrene. Okay, so the other one produced a more yellow pigment, fluorescein, okay. So then finally, oops, I went too, way too far. What happened there? The last one was the one that was hardest to take a picture of, okay? It was the opacity. I tried using the light, the background, and I failed miserably. So let's see what you got for results. Remember that the, uh, the rack number three, the opacity lab, you were supposed to see if you could figure out which one compared to the others was the most opaque, the most transparent and the one in between. So don't look at this, look at your, hopefully you wrote it down somewhere. So how many of you were able to determine of the three of them, which one did you think was the most opaque? It was kind of subtle. Staff, staff, thank you, that's correct. Yeah, thank you Amy, was that Amy there? Yeah. Staph saprophyticus was the most opaque. So if you didn't get that, write it down. Staph saprophyticus, correct. The most opaque. Which one was the most transparent of the three? Enterococcus faecalis. Correct, Enterococcus faecalis. Enterococcus is, remember the new name? This literally, in the past few years, they've changed the name. So this is older picture. So Enterococcus faecalis was the most transparent, and E. coli was uh, kind of in the middle, what do we call that? Translucent. Then we're gonna call that translucent. All right, so those are the results that you should have got. So you want to sketch those in your notebook. I'm going to, um, we're going to work, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit on our unknowns, and then we're going to do, we have two labs we have to set up. One is, uh, let's see, temperature effects, and the other one is UV light effects. And the UV light effects has one part of it that takes like forever. <laughs> so I'm going to just kind of, for time management, I'm gonna be coming around for the temperature effects and I'll be assigning pairs of students a particular temperature to make a water bath at. Okay, so uh, again, we're gonna do things a little bit out of order, but if, if you want, you can start by actually uh, trying to write in your pigmentation results, right, answer the discussion questions. I'm gonna go in the back and get the stuff that we need for uh, the labs today. Okay. But in the meantime, try to answer your discussion questions, try to fill in your